a little recap. Jesus, he warned his disciples and us of the persecution that we would face as his disciples. He told the disciples and us that we are not to be surprised if the world hates us because it hated him first. And he lets us also know that he chose them right out of the world. And because we are not of the world, right? The world who loves its own will hate us. The world hates us. It's just, it takes people that, wait a minute, the world hates us. This is the one thing that I had to sit there and go, okay, we already know that the world hates us. It just takes the people that's around us <laughs> to actually know about us, to know who we are before they make their judgments. But do keep in mind that the world does hate us, right? He goes on and says, if they persecuted me, and we all know that they did persecute him, they will also persecute you. So the bottom line is we're to expect persecution because they will see Jesus Christ alive in us. But in the midst of our persecution, Jesus also tells us that there will be those who will be listening and they will keep your word. So as you might be getting persecuted for him, there's going to be those who are around you that are going to hear, they're going to listen, they're going to hear what you say, and it's going to stay with them because they're going to hear the truth of Jesus Christ. And we know that the God, uh, God draws people to him through the Holy Spirit, right? And he also warned those who stepped out from religious systems for his name's sake as well, that they would bring heavy persecution to them as well. And Jesus tells us why that these religious systems do this, does this, is because they do not know the Father. Yet if Jesus did not come and speak to those who were in the religious system at that time, or do any of the works of his fathers, they would have no sin and continue on believing that they had no sin. But he came, he called them out, and now they are without excuse. Their sin was exposed before the light and before man. So we are to expect the world to not only hate us, but to persecute us. I know that sounds really negative, but he was being straight up during that time with his disciples. Like, hey, look, watch. We're like on the final night of Jesus having that time with them. And he's like, they're going to persecute you. But we are to view this persecution as their confession of recognizing Jesus Christ manifested through us by his fruit. The key is that we Christians are to abide in the vine, who is Jesus. We are to settle down and make ourselves at home with him. And when we abide in him, he will abide in us. We are also to abide in his word. We are to be sowing his word into our hearts every day. And we are to pray fervently without ceasing so that we remain in constant communication with him. Now, when these things are active in our lives, we, the branches, will bear much fruit. And this fruit is his fruit, as said in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23. It says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These fruits reveal the characteristics of Jesus Christ in us. So y'all need to put your mirrors away. No, I'm just joking. You know, <laughs> does that look like us? It's a lot of times when I was in youth, that was the question. Now, do these fruits show up in your lives? You know, does this a reflection of you when you look in the mirror? <laughs> so, and again, so because the world hated Jesus and persecuted him, the world will see the revelation of him living through our lives. Therefore, they will hate us and persecute us as well, making that point clear. But Jesus also reminds us that the helper will come and give us the power through his grace to testify of him through persecution. And we are to remember there will always be those listening. So he sums that up in the passage that we read last week. And now we're going to continue on to chapter 16, verse 1. He says, these things I have spoken to you, referring to chapters 14 through 15, that you should not be made to stumble. So he's telling them, I'm telling you these things so you may remain strong on the path of God's will. 
He says, so you don't stumble, but you remain strong and steady in him. He said in verse 2, they will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And I'm like, wow, wait, did you just say kill? Yes, he did. He will face the cross because of his obedience to the Father. And he is telling the disciples the extent of the persecution that they would face. They were learning and would soon see just how passionately they hated Jesus. And because of him, how hated they will be for them spreading the message of the gospel, the good news. And so this persecution they will face will cost them everything, such as being expelled out of the synagogues and excommunicated from them, and which meant that if they were excommunicated, uh, their families would also have to play along and not give them that same attention. They would have to, in a sense, ex excommunicate them as well. And they couldn't even go out to the market and buy stuff. They would be excommunicated. In a sense, you are being excommunicated out, like completely out, right? Or the other thing that Jesus was talking about, they would even be put to death, all in the name of God. And he tells them in verse 3, and these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. Now, although the Jewish religious leaders had a zeal for God, it was very misguided. So misguided that it says right here, they did not know God. Jesus called them out and said to them earlier, if you knew the Father, you would know me. If you knew the Father. He's calling them out. The Apostle Paul was known to have this zeal for God as well before coming to Christ. He would bound up the Christians, put them in prisons, or put them to death, all in the name of God. Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 2, he says, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. So the zeal of God was there. Paul knows because he witnessed it, he also had it. They had no knowledge of God nor understanding of him. They knew nothing about him personally. Now, they had a certain knowledge of him through the law, but this knowledge was not of a saving knowledge of him. And so their zeal for him was misguided because they did not know him or his ways. As the psalmist wrote in Psalm 95, Tim, it said, it is a people who go astray in their hearts and they do not know my ways. And we know that these religious leaders did not know the Father because they did not know his ways, which tell us they have gone astray in their hearts and wandered away from him as well. And so through their zeal of God, they will put them out of synagogues and kill them in the name of God. Jesus said in verse 4, But these things I have told you, that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. So this was an interesting verse because Jesus is basically saying, I'm telling you these things now for you to prepare your hearts so that when you, uh, you may remember my words when you face these things, right? He says, I'm telling you these now. I didn't tell you these things in the beginning because I was with you. Therefore, their hate and persecution was aimed directly at me. I have protected you and shielded you at the beginning, but I'm going to the Father. And when I'm gone, you will be my body on earth. So Jesus is now leading them down back to his departure and says in verse 5, but now I go away to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? It's a little odd, right? Now we know that Peter had asked Jesus previously in chapter 13, verse 36, where are you going? But when he asked Jesus, this asking was, I guess the best way to describe it was like when your child asks you, hey, where are you going? You know? And we know that when we go somewhere, your child's going to want to know. Where are you going? When are you going to be back? What are you going to buy me? I'm just kidding. But they always want to know. And it's not that they want to go. It's that they just want to know. 
So Jesus answered him previously, you know, but Peter took him at face value. He was not listening to his words. To think with, I mean, he was not even trying to think with spiritual discernment. None of them had really discern what was happening. Now, I, I can say spiritual discernment, but the spirit hadn't come yet. But he wasn't trying to think in the text of, this is the son of God. What is he trying to say? No, he was just like, okay, I'm listening. And this is the reason, again, why they didn't understand Jesus, but only heard what he said. There's a difference between listening and hearing. You can hear it, and it can just go fall on deaf ears, right? But if you're listening with intent, you're trying to understand everything that's come, being said. And that is why instead of rejoicing with him, their hearts were troubled. Jesus said, but because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Never, nevertheless, verse 7, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For I do not, if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So the disciples were overwhelmed with the fact that he was leaving. They did not understand uh, what was ahead of them, right? But Jesus also told them that he wouldn't leave them as orphans. So when you think about this whole context, I'm like, guys, you're kind of missing a lot of the, I mean, the big steak and potatoes was in chapter 14. 15, here comes this, this preparation. And 16, he's telling you, hey, you know, this is what, you're about to expect, and it's like they're missing everything. And he spoke of the helper, saying that the spirit of truth was going to be sent to them, which if they had any discernment, just knowing that the, this helper that would be sent to them individually with power and wisdom that comes with gifts, this would be something to rejoice in as well. First one being that, hey, he's going to the Father. He's going to the Father. He's going back to God. But, you know, in order for that to come, Jesus had to depart to the Father. And this was important because it is through the Holy Spirit in us that God will draw people back to him through us. So these, this message of the gospel being sent out is God's way of reconciling through his word, his message of the gospel, back to him. You know, we're not saving, he's saving. All we are, are being his vessels to share the gospel, but it's through the power of the Holy Spirit that this is all done, you know? And when he comes, he will perform several ministries. That we're talking of the Holy Spirit that are mentioned here in verse eight. It says, and when he has come, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So one of the Spirit's new ministries was that he will convict the world, right? Now, convict is the Greek word, elenho, which translates to expose one fault with fact and to convince the truth, all right? So he's going to be convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So the Holy Spirit of truth will be working on the minds of the unbelievers to show them of God, normally done through the life of believers, so he will convict the world, of verse 9, of sin, because they do not believe in me. Now, sin in the lives of people was at its worst the day that Jesus was crucified. But the sin that is the greatest is failure to believe in Jesus, the absolute rejection of him. Those who live their lives apart from Jesus and don't even bat an eye, they don't even bat an eye. Or they, they don't even think that they're in sin. They just live their life. Let alone, they don't even think about Jesus on a regular basis. But it also, it breaks my heart to know those who have given their hearts to God, you know, to the Lord, and have walked away from their first love, from their faith. And I've ran into some of those, you know, a couple of decades later, only to find that they went far from God. And they look more like the world you know, there was a pastor, he was my first pastor ever, and I ran into him, I saw him at the, uh, the pastor's conference about two years ago, and he says, it is so good to see people still walking with the Lord after decades, because it's truly a rare occurrence. 
you know, that they stay strong in the Lord. Now, I haven't been doing this as long as he has. I know that. But I have seen with my own eyes, and I'm telling you this straight up in my own heart, that it is good to be surrounded by people like you guys here who are still chasing after the Lord, who are still desiring him. And it's truly a blessing for me to be fellowshipping amongst you. All right. And as we assemble as a body, I know that it truly blesses him as well, you know, especially in times that we're in right now. And so Jesus tells us that the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin because they don't believe in me. Verse 10, it says, of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. In his crucifixion, the Jewish people showed that they thought that he was unrighteous. All right, because to be crucified on a tree back then was considered a cursed, like an accursed man by God. But the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus vindicated him as God's righteous servant, as referring to Isaiah 53, 11. So as they looked at him and they put him on that tree and they looked at him as this is an accursed man, there's no way anybody's going to believe him now. Through his resurrection, him's coming alive, and many seeing him and his ascension, the Holy Spirit will vindicate in many body, everybody's hearts that he is the righteous servant of God. And I love that. Verse 11 says, of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. It's such a, a great verse to get into. When we last Sunday, we learned more about um, the fall of Satan in the midst and why he was in the garden at the time he was. Um, I just like this because now we're seeing the judgment of him. I think it's great. But it says, through the death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus defeated Satan, who held the power over death. And although he was defeated at the cross, we still know that Satan is pretty much at work today and, and is fighting until the day that uh, he gets his judgment. Uh, but let's get some clarity concerning this a little bit about this whole uh, ruler and, of this world and, and how death uh, was defeated. Jesus destroyed Satan's right to rule over man. And I'll explain that in just one second when I get to the end. Which was given to him in the garden when Adam rebelled. Okay? But the idea is that Jesus took away his right to rule by allowing Satan to unlawfully take the sinless life of Jesus on the cross. Okay? And with Satan's unlawful action that he did on Jesus, the Lamb of God, he forfeited his right to rule over man. Now, let's get a little bit more clear when, with that statement. Jesus was without sin and was unjustly crucified and the end result is Satan has no right to those who come to God through Jesus Christ. Okay, so when we receive Christ, we are stepping out of the kingdom of darkness, right, into eternal life. So we're no longer under his jurisdiction of death. But those who are already in sin or in darkness already stand condemned. So... The defeat on the cross is the fact that now we have eternal life and he has no jurisdiction over our lives. Okay? And now he stands judged as a condemned criminal awaiting his final judgment. So these are the ministries of the Holy Spirit when he comes. And Jesus said in verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Now, if we were to take the last two and a half chapters and try to do them all tonight, it would be a lot to try to take in. And the problem, too, in the midst of this is that the disciples already had troubled hearts. So between that and all this wonderful word that he just shared with them and taught them, he said, you cannot bear them now. I have so much to tell you, but there's, you guys are already look like you're cracking, you know. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to share. He goes, but however, verse 13, when he, the spirit of truth has come, 
He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. So the Holy Spirit of truth would, the, would guide them in truth. Well, how? Well, it says right here, for he will not speak to us on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. Well, who is he hearing? The Father. All right, it's the Father that is speaking through the Holy Spirit to us. Okay? The Father will tell the Spirit what to teach, what to say in any situation to the apostles and obviously to us about the Son. Okay? So what we receive from the Holy Spirit is from the Father. You know, I think that's amazing. Jesus died, so our relationship, we got to keep this in, in complete context. He died so our relationship can be reconciled back to who? The Father. All right? He had to send his son in there so he can draw the people back to him the way it was. And it is through the Father that we are taught concerning his son, Jesus. And I think this is absolutely amazing. And he will tell you the things to come, which we see uh, right here where it says he guides us into all truth. So he tells you all the things that come as he's guiding you into truth. And that, that's just, I love it. Verse 14, it says, He will glorify me for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All the things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he is in the Spirit will take of mine and declare to you. So it's, it's kind of like this great thing that we see. We see the Father and that everything that the Father has is in Jesus, right? And then we have Jesus, whatever he has from the Father, the Spirit takes from him and gives to us. It's just a beautiful picture. So, but notice all these things concerning the Holy Spirit. And, they're, and they have this great little true sequences here. They got the Spirit of truth, number one, has come. And we know that to be true in our lives. He will guide you into all truth. He will not only speak of his own authority. He will not speak of his own authority. He will speak whatever he hears, right? He will tell you things to come. He will glorify Jesus, and he will take of Jesus and show it to you. All these things that we see in these verses are the workings of the Holy Spirit. This is how he works. He will work alongside us and dwell in us and helps us to perceive, to understand, and speak concerning our Savior. And when we learn something that just blows our minds, or just like, wow, you know, kind of put in a, in, a, in a mind of wonder. And when we just simply marvel, even at the marvel of G Jesus' love, that love that he says, love others as I loved you. And we know it's a sacrificial love. And trying to wrap our mind around it is kind of like trying to wrap our mind around the Grand Canyon. You know, when you're looking at it, it's just, it's impossible. It's so much information. But in those moments, when you have that, just like, oh, man, God is good. You are experiencing the work of the Holy Spirit in you in that moment in your life. Now, Jesus says in verse 16, a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me because I go to the Father, speaking of his departure. Then, this is where I love the human side of the, the disciples. Then the, some of the disciples said among themselves, what is this, what does he keep saying to us? A little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while, you will see me. And because I go to the Father? Now, for us, we understand clearly what he's saying, you know? But for the disciples, it was like words that came out of nowhere. It's like, it was a mystery to them. It didn't make sense to them. And again, it's because of their understanding of the Messiah that would come to the earth and reign his kingdom on, you know, on earth, which happens at the second coming of Christ. You know, that's when he comes, it's to bring judgment and his kingdom will rule. And so amongst themselves, they said, therefore, what is this that he says a little while? We do not know what he is saying. Now Jesus knew what they desired to ask him. And he said to them, are you acquiring among yourselves about what I said? 
a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while you will see me again, most assuredly I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice, and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. And I'm sure they're just thinking at that moment, wow, you just answered everything in that. <laughs> what is he saying, you know? But he's telling the disciples that they will mourn, and his death would be agony for them, but the world will be very happy over it, right? But through this event, their grief will turn to joy because of his resurrection. And all these things will click with them when the spirit of understanding will bring forth the interpretation that would enable them to know that he had to die, right? And would open their eyes and, and their minds to see that the, all these prophecies of the Messiah were fulfilled by Jesus. And Jesus continues and says, let me just explain this a little bit further. You see, a woman, when she's in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no, lo no longer remembers the anguish. For joy that a human being has been born into the world. They're probably going, okay. Right? And then the moms in this room, I'm sure you guys can testify what Jesus is saying here, that as soon as that child comes in, it's like all the pain goes away. Your focus now has and your eyes and attentions on your baby. And as a father, we have witnessed this miracle as well in our lives. And, and I can testify along with him that once we hear that baby's cry for the first time, there's this just unbelievable joy. I would even say, because I would not, I would be harsh to not say this, but through adoption, you know, the paperwork is quite lengthy and painful. But when the child is now in your arms, that same joy is there. And it overshadows all the pain and anguish that you went, you know, went through before. Amen. Jesus said in verse 22, Therefore you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy uh, no one will take from you. And I love that. Because that right there is coming from Jesus. And your joy no one will take from you. Why? Because Jesus is our joy. He's very much alive. And he alone is our source of joy. No one can take him from us. Even when Paul speaks of joy, he's in a Roman prison. He's in chains. He says, rejoice in the Lord. I say again, rejoice. And rejoice means to show great joy. Jesus is very much alive and with us, and he is the source of joy. And no one, no matter how bad of a day you could be having or facing, no one can take him away from you or his joy or his peace or his comfort because you get all that in him, and I'm thankful for him. But the disciples were still trying to figure this whole thing out right here. And he says in verse 23, And in that day, meaning after his ascension, you will ask me nothing. Because he will no longer be physically with them. But now their dependence will be through faith and the Holy Spirit that will be there to help them. He said, Most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Jesus has given them the right to ask the Father for whatever they need. We ask it in Jesus' name, and the Father will give it to them. Now, this isn't the secret formula which will enable the one to get his will done. You know what I'm saying? Which means I can't stand here and pray and ask for that special edition built to serve Dodge Ram pickup. Because it's just not going to happen. That's from, that's from me, Right? Whatever we ask the Father in his name, these requests, right, are tied to the work of the Son in doing the Father's will. So when we ask in his name, it's for his work. It's for his work. And when I said before, when we're abiding in him and he in us, that means we are aligned with him in his will. 
because we're listening to him. We're having that conversation with him. We're getting in that word with him. We're praying with him fervently. And he says, hey, I need you to do this. Okay, Lord, I'm doing this with you, but I just need you to make provisions to help this happen. And he's going to say, you know what? I got you. I'm taking care of that already. We're moving. That is the image of of what we're looking at here when it comes when you ask in my name. So when we ask in the Father or ask anything of the Father in Jesus' name, this puts prayer and his will at the forefront of our hearts and minds when when we go before him. We ask, but it is with the heart that his will be done. His will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 24, until you, until now you have asked nothing in my name, Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Now, up to this point, the disciples had not prayed in Jesus' name because he's not left. But through his death and receiving of the Holy Spirit, they are able now at that point to go before the throne of God and to ask in Jesus' name. There's a big difference. You know, once the veil was torn and he resurrected, now we were able to go before God with boldness. And I love that. So now at this point, now that the man who believe in him are reconciled back to God, God is now able to work through prayer in man's life through his son. Verse 25 says, These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. Now, as you can see, the last previous three verses He was kind of speaking things that were kind of over their head, speaking of labor and all that. So they were just kind of like, okay, somewhere guys in there try to catch what the main point is and let's go back and huddle over here and let's try to figure this out. But no, he says, look, you know, the time is coming where I won't be talking like that with you, Uh, but I will tell you plainly of the Father. So now Jesus, in context of chapter 14 and 16, is still also speaking of comfort because he's laid down a lot of heavy stuff on them. First, I'm leaving. Second, the world's going to hate you and persecute you. So he's, he's telling you that, that oh, I may be into death, you know, and kick you out of synagogues, but the helper's coming. And so in the midst of this heavy stuff, he's, com- he's trying to comfort them as well while preparing them for what's coming. And then he lets them know that this whole time, you know, I've been speaking to you with this in figurative language, or as that word translates in the Greek as in parables or proverbs. So he, he was speaking in a specific way, which contains like figures of speech, um, parallelism, and they were ambiguous, and they had hidden meanings, and they just kind of kept going over their heads, because I don't know if they were truly listening, but they were hearing him, you know? But Jesus is telling them that he will no longer speak that way to them, but soon will be speaking to them with familiar words, plainly speaking to them. And in that day, verse 26, you will ask in my name. And I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I come from the Father. Now, verse 26, I love it. Because this is, you're seeing Jesus saying, hey, look, that day you're going to be asking him. You're not going to be telling me, hey, ask the Father for me. No, I'm stepping aside. He goes, for the Father loves you himself. He loves you because you love me and you believe in me. You're going before the Father. And to me, that, that is the most beautiful picture. And it speaks words to us that this is, this is a privilege you know, to be able to just hear the Son of God tell us that we can go before the Father in that manner. So never take that manner for granted. And all this was done through Jesus' work on the cross. And I just love that he's telling them, like, you know, I'm not taking your request. No, you go ask the Father. And at verse 28, it says, I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said to him, see, now you are speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now, I think that's kind of hilarious because he did say pretty, pretty simple. I came from the father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and I go to the father. 
Hey, that's what I'm talking about. Verse 30, now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came from forth from God. And Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Like, really? This whole time? And because I said these things, now you believe? I have, to, I have to personally give it to these guys, you know. That was pretty, pretty amazing for them. I mean, they were like blatantly honest in their faith. They're like, now we believe, and because of this, you know. But, and he's like, really? <laughs> but Jesus knew their limitations better than they knew themselves. They believed, but it wasn't through a strong faith. It was through weakness. And it wasn't until after his death and resurrection and the receiving of the Holy Spirit that we saw, in, or we will see in Acts, that their faith became strong. But in the assurance of their faith, Jesus warns them and says, indeed, the hour is coming. Yes, has now come. And he's been saying for a while that the hour is coming. That the hour is coming. A little bit of time. A little bit of time is coming. You know, it's past. I only have a little bit of time. But we know that after this, this, this section of 16, Jesus will, will say a couple of prayers, and that's when the guards will come. So he knows at this point that has now come. He goes, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. So he warns the disciples that your faith will be shaken and loosened before it will be firm and strong in me. Jesus knew their shortcomings and their weaknesses, but tells them that yet you may leave me alone, but the Father is with me. And letting them know was not calling them out, but was letting them know that he was already anticipating this was going to happen, right? And assures them, hey, look, I know you guys are going to scatter. It's going to happen, all right? I know. But just rest assured that the Father's with me. You know, I'm okay. The Father's with me. I'm not alone. Verse 33 says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He said in me, you may have peace. Paul tells us the same thing in Ephesians 2.14. He says, for he himself, Jesus alone, is our peace. Jesus says, in the world you will have tribulations or oppression or distress. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 3.12, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ, Jesus will suffer persecution. All right. And then he tells us also that be a good cheer because I have overcome the world. And cheer means courage. Be of good courage as the translation speaks. And it says in First John, John tells us, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them, which is speaking of the world. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And boy, do we know that verse. Jesus has overcome the world. Jesus is the truth. So we can trust him when he tells us he is coming back to receive us to himself. That's coming. And to me, that's comfort. And that's peace, even in the world that we're living in right now. So i like, come, Lord Jesus, come. So in closing, all these things that the disciples were unsure of in this text, we are all sure of these things in our lives today. We see it all working in our lives. We are sure of the Holy Spirit of truth that dwells in us and comes alongside us in times of need. We are walking testimonies of the Holy Spirit that the Spirit of truth has come. He does guide you into all truth. He does not speak of his own authority. He does speak to you whatever he hears from the Father. He does tell you things to come. <laughs> he does glorify Jesus. He does take of Jesus and shows it to you. He takes everything that is of his and shows to us. But through prayer, we have access to the Father anywhere, at any time. And this is only made possible through Jesus and what he did for us. But isn't it comforting, comforting and, and encouraging knowing everything that Jesus has said in these chapters 
has come to be. Everything has come, even in our lives here today, it's, it's truth. Even today, it's, it's, there's no other way to describe his truth. His truth is the standard, and here we are living and, and experiencing this, uh, this truth from something that was written, you know, almost 2,000 years ago. When I think of all the words of Jesus in these last three chapters, it's as if he's speaking to us in this very room today, preparing us for the times that we are in now. Jesus does tell his disciples, as he's prepping them this whole time, at the end of all this, to, to preach the gospel and go make disciples, you know. Jesus is exactly what we need, especially in this time. He's what we need in our lives. You guys say amen to that? Amen. But I will tell you this. Jesus is exactly what our neighbors, our coworkers, and those who surround us need as well. I'm going to tell you this. As Jesus warned his and his dis- disciples to prepare him, be prepared for what the Lord is, will do in your life through the Holy Spirit. Be prepared. Right? There is work to be done. There's a lot of work to be done, and the harvest is ready. So be prepared. Just listen for him. In prayer, listen to him. Abide in him. Let his word abide in you. And just keep rooted in that vine. Keep that that strong connection. And watch the Holy Spirit work. Be at work in your lives. And I'm telling you. There's things that are going to happen pretty soon. He's going to be calling on us. You know, he could be calling on you now. So we need to take heed to his word because we're in these times. We need to listen and obey him. But be excited at the same time. Be encouraged that he's, he's got the whole path lined out. All he's got to do is just walk in it. He's got, he'll make all the provisions. Line your will with his will. He's going to make all those provisions. Everything's just going to happen. We're living testimony of that because we're here in Clarksville. (laughs) Amen? All right, well, let's pray.